Thank you, Howard. Dr. Ed Amoroso is the Chief Security Officer for AT&T. He's responsible for real-time security protection of AT&T's networks and computing infrastructure. Dr. Amoroso holds both MS and PhD degrees in computer science from the Stevens Institute of Technology, where he has also taught for the past 20 years. Ed has over 24 years of experience in the industry and has written the book on cybersecurity, literally. He just re released his fifth book, Cyber Attacks, Protecting National Infrastructure, where he initiates a comprehensive dialogue around proper methods for reducing national risk. Ed's career with AT&T began at Bell Labs, where he worked on securing the Unix operating system. More recently, he has championed AT&T's network-based security strategy centered around emerging in-the-cloud protection services. He is the 1999 winner of the AT&T Labs Technology Medal for his contributions to large-scale intrusion detection. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ed Amoroso. So um, about 12 years ago, uh, I got involved in a project where I was coming down here to Washington quite a bit. It was the um, Y2K Prep Center, the White House was doing. Remember the uh, Information Coordination Center? We're going to have like all this data feed into a big room and kind of watch as the Y2K um, millennium change occurred. It sounds so quaint now, and it's funny that there are a lot of youngsters that you run into who don't even know what that was, right? You talk about Y2K and they say, what are you talking about? So good way of uh, testing whether we all share a generation when, when that uh, comes up. But the reason I bring it up is um, in prepping for that big you know, fusion center, um, around September, October of 99, um, I went over to Fort Meade for a meeting. A group of people got invited. I think there's some people in the room here who were there. And they told us about this thing that I kind of knew existed but hadn't taken that seriously called like a zombie attack. That's what we called it then. And, and the idea, and the same sort of principle holds for botnets today, is that I can myself sort of direct all of you to do something, right? Like my voice to your ears is a one-to-many relation, and if you're quiet, it works fine. But if your ears could somehow reflect, you know, the, um, the energy that I provide at a target, you know, the congressman, it would sound like you're all shouting. Um, and that would be very unfortunate to shut the website down. And that was kind of the idea. Um, and they gave us some signatures, and I went back to AT&T thinking, you know, sure we won't find these. Found them everywhere. Like, found them all over our network. And um, got very nervous. So I sort of spun up our CEO at the time, Mike Armstrong. We spun up President Clinton. Got everybody going. And I got invited to go talk to some legislators. You know, I, I would find myself in a room with a bunch of staffers and, um, you know, a prominent legislator would come in. I remember one... Um, Congresswoman um, had me come in, had the whole group there and said, now explain to us what this problem is. And, and I tried to explain it. You know, I said, you know, there's you know, a bunch of computers and they get sort of infected and they aim something at a target. And they're all just scribbling everything down, like writing every word I was saying. Um, and then there was quiet afterwards and they all turned to this young lady who I guess was like the... Uh, the tech lead or tech coordinator for that office. And she said something like, so the problem is that like all the electricity from these computers will go and cause like a fire or something. And I just looked at her like, you, are you kidding? And, and I, I, like, I didn't know what to say. And that was sort of typical of the conversation back in 99. I remember getting on the train going home and called my boss and she said, how, how, how to go? And I said, I, I almost can't believe, you know, how the, there's sort of this ignorance around cybersecurity. And it's not just Washington, it's sort of everywhere. Well, fast forward to 2010, 2011, it's changed fundamentally, absolutely changed. You know, recently I was at Rice University on a panel and Congressman Mike McCurl's there, nice guy, and I'm thinking, He's going to give like a congressman type talk, no uh, offense, but, um, um, <laughs> but he got up and he gave this technical presentation on how a botnet works. My mouth dropped open. 
And, you know, recently I, I gave testimony to the Senate Commerce Committee, and, you know, everybody has sort of their prepared remarks, and then afterwards you mull around and chat. I had a chance to chat with some of the members, Senator Rockefeller and others. These guys understand the problem. Like, they they able to so internalize how it works, and they're able to make intelligent, reasonable comments, and it's just changed fundamentally. So I congratulate you all on a decade where we've gone from thinking like a botnet is going to start a fire to, you know, really kind of understanding how it works. Now, before we get into all this uh, self-congratulatory uh, stuff, l let me point out, we have a very big mess right now. The, the problem is not solved by heightening or raising the level of uh, attentiveness and, and dialogue. That's a good first step. Um, and you saw with uh, Howard, he understands this problem as good as, as well as anyone. Um, but what's happened is, and I've been looking at this for 26 years, and I think it's pretty clear. What's happened is we've optimized the infrastructure protections in government and industry to kind of an enterprise-grade threat. Like, we've done things that are reasonable. Remember, 10 years ago, we'd be saying, pick better passwords. Make sure you're running antivirus on your computers. Make sure you patch your systems. Well, again, fast forward. You guys all run antivirus on your computers. Anybody in here skinny dip on the internet, you know, without any stuff on your machine? Um, you know, I, I, I raise my hand because I think most of the real threats actually dance around that stuff. Or how about patching? In, in the 2000, 2001, 2002 time frame, as an infrastructure manager, I remember that when patches would come in, we would play patch roulette, meaning patch would come in from, like, Microsoft or something, you go, yeah, I'll wait, too much work to patch. And you'd wait, and you had a bunch of patches, and then they'd come out with a bunch of patches in a service pack, and you'd do that. So you might go six months without worrying about patching because yeah, it's a lot of work, what's the point? Well, after the viruses and worms we saw in 2003, we became super patchers. Now it's like we stand at attention, and Microsoft, as an example, as a lot of companies, they have Microsoft Tuesday, man, Microsoft Tuesday hits, and boom! Everybody in this room has infrastructure managers at your place of work that jump at the, at the it's re ready, set, patch. Boom, everybody jumps and patches. We become super patchers. So we've, we've exaggerated you know, all the obvious stuff. The problem is that our adversary has raised their game, and we have not. And the problem is that in computer security, unlike certain parts of engineering or IT management or whatever, you know, where you can do something and it can stand. You build the Brooklyn Bridge in 1870 and it's still there. Uh, computer security doesn't work that way. It has to constantly evolve and change. And that's an uncomfortable message. Because for most of us, we think, well, gee, I'm patching, I run any, like everybody in this room has become a, a security administrator, right? You all are, all your kids, your parents, you probably do it for your parents. Um, every business, every government agency, we're all on our own, right? Uh, the new intrusion detection signatures pop out. Everybody rushes to go put them in their systems. It's inefficient, it's tiring, it's expensive. And then I get up here and say, we've got to raise our game. And you think, what are you talking about, raise our game? We already have. I'm exhausted. I'm doing all this stuff. Well, the answer is that we need to be doing things differently. We don't need to be spinning our wheels faster. We need to be doing things differently. I'll give you an example. Um, incident response is something that all of you probably do in your, in your businesses. You're all collecting data from the internet, you know, government agencies and, you know, uh, legal firms and IT companies. Oh, we'll collect stuff from the internet and try and determine if something's going on. Well, I can tell you that there may be a thousand things you would do better than a carrier or ISP, but one thing we will and continue to do better than you is collecting data to determine if a worm or virus or botnet is occurring. We have a vantage point that's fundamentally different. So the question is, why are you doing it? Why aren't we doing it? And then the question emerges, well, you know, should it be sort of, uh, you know, a standard and everybody just is forced to do this one thing? Well, once you do that, then you violated the principle of constantly evolving. It has to be a business. It has to be something where we're excited and we're serving customers and we're collecting data. We tell you when there's a worm or a virus and we protect you. That's how this country operates. 
And that's what we think is an example of something that could be fundamentally different. I'll give you another example, and if there's CIOs in the room, might want to plug your ear for this one. But for about 20 years, we've focused most of our attention in IT on simplifying and making more common and interoperable our systems, right? First demo I ever did at Bell Labs in 1985 connected a Unix system to a non-Unix system, and we att attracted three-star generals to come see that that was actually possible. You connect something. You know, we're like, look, you know, we've built, designed our own protocol to make that work. Now, 20 years later, it's impossible to disconnect things. Like if you could actually show a demo of a network that is disconnected from another, you'd get you know, uh, four-star generals coming to visit. They wouldn't believe that it was possible that you could actually separate two things because everything's connected. So IT has been around making everything the same. Everybody in this room at work, I'm guessing, has exactly the same desktop. You know, unless you work for like a graphics firm or you're like in San Francisco at some cool dot com, then you got apples. Everybody else in here, I could probably write down exactly the PC configuration and the applications and the software that you have. That fundamentally simplifies the attack approach. So here's one for you. My new book in the cyber attacks thing, one of the chapters is on, you know, gulp gulp diversity, meaning intentionally designing into our essential services some degree of enforced non-interoperability. We've done that in the military for years, right? Cipernet is not supposed to be connected to a bunch of other things. But in businesses, and certainly in the civilian agency sector, we don't have anything like that. Everything connects to everything else, and we celebrate that, and we talk about that as something that makes sense. Now, I, I, I get that that certainly is good in, certain, in, in a certain sector and you know, for certain uh, innovative uh, purposes, but in essential critical infrastructure components, maybe we need to dial it back a little bit and think about things like that. I'll give you one more example, uh, deception. Um, you know that, that show with Chris Hansen where he like, catches the, uh, the, the predators? Uh, pretty creepy show, right? But the um, Bottom line is that in the old days, we used to catch bad people by glomping, you know, putting alligator clips onto a wire, and an AT&T technician listens, and Sammy the Bull and John Gotti, they, you know, admit something, you know, you know, you know arrest them. It doesn't work anymore. You can't do that on the internet. Now the way you catch predators and others on the internet is you deceive. You deceive at the end point. Question, how much research and development, how much deployment have we had in infrastructure around the use of deceptive honeypots and traps? Almost none, amazingly. When an adversary hits your infrastructure and finds a weak spot, today in 2011, they're pretty sure that weak spot is real. Why don't we throw some dummies at them? The military's been using dummies and decoys for 200 years, we don't do any of that in cybersecurity. There's almost no R&D there. The reason I bring this up is because here I am, a security person, telling you that 10 years ago it was passwords and antivirus and patching, and those are the words we use over and over again. Got news for you, that ain't working. That's not stopping things like the Stuxnet worm. Remember all this patching we're doing? You know, Redmond says patch, we go boom, patch. In fact, Microsoft Tuesday isn't even fast enough. We have Microsoft pre-Thursday to prepare for Tuesday. Like, we're so good at it. Stuxnet Worm had four zero-day vulnerabilities in Microsoft operating system. You know what zero-day vulnerability is? That's when the bad guys find a hole, but they don't report it to the vendor. They weaponize it. What good is patching if somebody's finding vulnerabilities and not telling you about it? You have to do it. I get that you have to continue to do that, but that can't be where we stop. We have to raise the level. Things are changing. I'm going to leave you with one last thought about sort of technical change because I think it's kind of a funny story. Um, I interact a lot with uh, young people, both at Stevens, my, my little hacker dude's son and his friends. They're all going to you know, be the next Zuckerberg. And when I, when I talk to them, sometimes like I'm talking to this kid recently who's telling me about this business he's going to start. I go, oh, you know, I'm asking questions. And I said, um, he told me he was going to do something. I said, oh, are you going to like, do that from your website? And he looked at me and he goes, Mr. Amoroso, 
the web is like so 2005. It's like all about broadband apps now. And I'm looking at him going, web is so 2005. Like, have we already gotten to the point where things that we're just getting used to, like, you know, using the internet and the web and government, are they already obsolete? You want to know something? Maybe. Like, I mean, adopting that mindset of this fast, dramatic, rapid change, not evolution, but revolution, is the way we have to do cybersecurity. And it, easy, it isn't easy. So it has to start with the essential critical infrastructure services. We need to raise the game with some principles that maybe are somewhat different than the ones we need to deal with. And we better do it pretty quickly because I think our adversaries are certainly uh, moving pretty quickly. So with that, I appreciate the invite. A um, lot of, lot of uh, friendly, familiar faces here and uh, always enjoy coming down and seeing you. And I hope you enjoy the conference. Take care, everyone. That was a great talk and, and essentially made us all paranoid, which is a very important thing to do and we'll also go and check. What is the role for government from your perspective in not just urging people to do more but putting some laws on the books which actually advance us to where we need to be? So I'm, I'm, I've been a manager for a while and have gotten very pragmatic when people ask for recommendations that are management oriented. What I've said when people ask what should government be doing, I say government's first step, first priority should be managing government infrastructure a little better than we've been doing. I mean, there's an awful lot of civilian agency infrastructure, sites, gateways, systems, networks, military infrastructure, um, intelligence community infrastructure, infrastructure that touches international systems. I think government needs to do a better job there. I'm, I'm, uh, I manage a program at AT&T um, that has you know, responded to and is providing service under the GSA Networks MTIPS program. And amazingly, a lot of the uh, solicitations we see and a lot of the civilian agency customers that we talk to who in inherently, keep in mind what MTIPS is about in the tick, government had a gazillion you know, gateways that are all managed in a lot of different crazy ways. Some real well, some very poorly, some average. And I think it was Karen Evans at OMB who said, this probably isn't such a great idea, by the way, I agree and said, we should rethink this. We should do these sites a little better, and we should do a lot less. I forget, it was something like, I might get this number wrong, but it was like from tens of thousands to like 50. And, um, and, and the thing that was sort of missing there, and the thing that you know, government always says, what can we do? And so here's an example. Is you completely missed the denial of service problem there. I and mean, put yourself in the shoes of the adversary. Let's say you're sitting there you know, watching these government initiatives. You hate America. You want to affect the continuity of operations and government in the U.S., and you're looking at this thing called TIC and MTIPS, and you go, hmm, right now if I want to bring down the U.S. government, I have to hit 15,000 different, diverse, crazy gateways all over the place. God, I'll never find them or understand them or what, but the proposal is let's make 50 that are exactly the same. Uh, hmm, says the adversary. That sounds a lot better to me. Now, the answer to that is out in the infrastructure, the carriers, the ISPs can stop denial of service attacks for the most part and can do a pretty good job of doing something. So I've been saying government's first role has to be for the infrastructure that it controls. You don't have to ask anybody. There's no controversy around that. Let's get that right. And I think you underestimate the impact that government decisions on procurement and on tools and on systems and on software has on the rest of the country. I think in the 80s and 90s, government kind of developed like an inferiority complex. That's when the term COTS was invented. Remember that? It was like, God, don't design something for government. Buy COTS, like tells COTS. Like COTS is commercial off the shelf. You, know, you just go buy this commercial stuff. Here's what happens when you go that COTS game. Let's say you're an adversary off in wherever, you're in well-funded land, you're a terrorist, you're a state-sponsored group, whatever, and you know, pick your favorite government agency here, that they're probably buying their antivirus from like McAfee or Symantec. They probably have firewalls from Cisco or Checkpoint. They probably do this, they do that. You can pretty much, on a whiteboard, describe exactly what the gateways would look like. Well, as you design your attack, build that staging environment 
and make sure you can dance around all that cot stuff. So you go commercial off the shelf, you go standard, you're going to get commercial off the shelf standard security, which will stop the easy stuff, but will never stop the harder stuff like Stuxnet worm. Hey, government, you know, don't, don't forget you have a lot of power. I come from the, the, the private sector, but we see what you control and what you do. It really does have an impact. That would be my first uh, advice. It's, it's a bipartisan thing. It's not political. It's engineering, and it's things that you already control. So good luck with that. I, hope that's, I think that's the next step. <laughs> well, great. Thank you very much. Ed, thank you very much. That was great, and I especially appreciate your, your new vote of confidence in the, uh, at least some members of Congress. <laughs> it reminds me of the story uh, about 10 years ago that uh, uh, folks at Yahoo have heard me tell many times. Uh, in, uh, about 10 years ago, my son was 14 years old. Yahoo Internet Life named me the most Internet-friendly member of Congress. I was just absolutely proud of that. I went home. Remember, he was sitting at his computer, and I said, Bobby, Yahoo just named me the most Internet-friendly member of Congress. Without batting an eye, he looked at me and he said, gee, Dad, that's sad. <laughs> ten, ten years later, and times have just changed dramatically. My son's much more polite. <laughs> Thanks, Ed, very much. Thank you all.